All right, thank you. Uh, hey, everyone, and welcome to WiseLine. We're very happy to have you here today. Hello to all WiseLiners, and also welcome to the people new to our network. My name is Brett Andrews. I'm a staff engineer here at WiseLine. Those who haven't heard about WiseLine and WiseLine Academy before, let me do a quick introduction. WiseLine is a software development and design services company with operations in the USA, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain. We have over six years of experience and more than 600 employees worldwide. We help other high growth companies to build better products faster through our different disciplines, such as technical writing, UX, project management, and all engineering disciplines, such as software development, QA, AI, mobile, DevOps, and more. WiseLine is the trusted ally of brands such as National Geographic, Shape Security, and the Washington Post. As part of our culture, WiseLine empowers employees and the community to innovate and grow their careers. This is the reason why WiseLine Academy was created. WiseLine Academy is a platform that offers free educational programs such as workshops, talks, and certifications in today's most high value skills and technology. You can follow us on social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn to learn about upcoming courses. As part of our commitment to the community, we love to host awesome people who enjoy contributing to the industry. And today we have a very special guest. Ron Ribbonzaft is the co-founder and CTO of Epsigon and also an AWS serverless hero. Ron is a passionate developer with an Army Elite Intelligence Unit background and vast experience in network infrastructure and cybersecurity. Thanks in advance, Ron, for being here today and sharing your knowledge with us. Before starting, let me share with you some notes and our code of conduct. Uh, please identify yourself in Zoom using your name, mute your microphones, uh, use the link posted in the chat to ask any questions. Please focus your questions on the presented topic, turn off your camera in case of connection issues, and please note that recording is not allowed. Uh, and for our code of conduct, please be respectful. There are no bad questions or ideas. Be welcoming and patient. Be, caref be careful in the words that you choose. Thanks in advance for helping us to uh, to have a great event today. Uh, now we are ready to go. Round the mic is all yours. Thank you very much, Brett. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining. Uh, let me just share the screen quickly. Um, so again, thank you very much for joining. In the following session, we're going to discuss about observability. I'm pretty sure that it's a term that you're constantly hearing, especially it goes along with serverless and microservices and modern applications. Uh, so in this kind of uh, session, we're going to actually drill down to understand what it means. We're also going to have some live demos and, you know, some cool things around. So uh, stick around. As Brent, Brett mentioned, I'm the CTO at Epsagon and I'm also an AWS serverless hero. So I really like to advocate new and modern and, you know, uh, future forward uh, kind of uh, infrastructure and environment. So feel free to ask me at this point or later on any question that you might have. So let's get going. As I mentioned, CDO, uh, AWS Serverless Hero, like to look for whales all over the world, Australia, Hawaii, anywhere uh, out there, and feel free to uh, ping me over Twitter. My DMs are open for everyone. Now, when we're thinking about observability, you know, something comes to the top of our head, says monitoring, logging, and we're going to start with that, but then we're going to uh, understand the bigger picture and what exactly is observability, and then especially diving into distributed tracing and this whole ecosystem, which is something that's starting to be very interesting and very new uh, in the modern applications. And when we're thinking about monitoring, you know, first thing that comes to mind is lots of charts and, you know, what's going on and traffic. But Google really states very well what should be monitored. Uh, they state it as the four golden signals with the SRE book that they'll be able to share afterwards. It's open for everyone. Uh, and it shares four crucial signals that we need to look at them. Latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. Latency is pretty straightforward. How long it takes for our customer to do an operation on our product or on our website. Second is traffic. How much traffic do we get? Uh, is it getting more or less than we used to? And obviously number of errors, which we aim to be at zero, uh, but it never really happens. And saturation. This is a golden signal that many uh, tend to miss because it's just you know, we don't think about it, but saturation tells us, in other words, how full is our system? It, or in other words, if our system is about to uh, crash because it doesn't have any more resources. So all of these are crucial. In order to get them, the traditional agent-based monitoring 
tells us, let's put an agent that will collect metrics, CPU, disk, disk, network, and so on from our service or, you know, a application, and it will ship it somewhere so we'll be able to plot it on a chart. The only thing that bothers us here is that metrics are not enough. Metrics just tells us a symptom of something that happened, and the agent collects just the metrics. And when something goes wrong and we need to troubleshoot, which happens almost every time, we need something more than that. We need the debug data or the logs themselves. In order to capture logs, uh, so we're introducing another agent or a log shipper, or we can call it in any way, uh, another one that is agent-based that will usually dump the log in a remote kind of location, usually Elastic or Splunk or some log aggregation tool. And the only inherent problem with logging is that if you haven't logged it, you won't see that. It means that you're the one that's responsible to manually log anything that you want, which is okay for a start, but let's try to, uh, think what's happening in modern kind of environments. So, oops, sorry, uh, we know that our applications are shifting from monolithic applications, host-based ones towards microservice and even serverless, uh, distributed, event-driven, uh, lots of resources, third-party API, clouds, environments. This makes our application much more complex. I mean, every single resource becomes simplified but then the whole ecosystem, the, old, the bigger picture becomes really complex to monitor and troubleshoot. And when we're thinking today about us, the engineers and the DevOps that needs to maintain and understand this complexity, usually we suffer from challenges such as uh, long troubleshooting time. We've deployed a new feature, where's the new problem? How do we understand the old path or the old chain of events in this kind of system? And then also being able to observe it, being able to understand what it takes from end to end or what it takes to, uh, you know, to understand which resources are talking to one another and ultimately even getting to the point where you can optimize it. So your customer experience will get, your customers will get a better experience on your application. Now, in order to really understand what's happening, we need observability and observability tells us what are the, the pillars that we need to collect in order to understand our production or even development environment. And it goes with, with three pillars, metrics, logging, and tracing. So metrics, in other words, tells us what happened. For example, a uh, high amount of errors or a longer, like higher latency that our user experienced. So it tells us what is the problem. Then we need to go into the logs to understand why it happened. Why do we get these kind of exceptions? What are these problems that we're experiencing? And you know, dig into the actual uh, data. And then tracing, which is the part that we're going to discuss a lot throughout this conversation, uh, is tells us where something happened. It tells us, or it constructs the old story from the user all through all of our services that tells us exactly what happened. And I think that you know having a solution for different, like different solutions for different pillars can just make it hard. And, and let's start to speak about it. So let's start with logging best practices. I think that the first and foremost one is to print out structured logs. Stop printing raw uh, logging information, print it in a structured JSON or log, so you'll be able to parse it and understand what's actually going on and enrich it with some metadata, like what's the service name that I'm uh, currently handling and what's the endpoint and what stage am I, is it production or dev? And try to automate it as much as possible. And once you already do it and you're shipping it into a, like a centralized solution for log aggregation, try to index the fields that you're using the most. And I think it goes without saying to start using some uh, demo time. I hope that my demo wouldn't crush us this way, but let's start with the first thing. So I'm talking about structured logging. And for this purpose of the, uh, the old demonstration that we're going to have, we're going to use Python and Flask. Python, for whoever uh, that is not aware, is a programming language, scripting language that is very easy to get started, pretty similar to Node. And then Flask is the popular, probably one of the most popular web frameworks to handle incoming requests and build REST APIs, pretty similar to Express and Spring and the other frameworks. So what I'm having here is a Flask application that honestly all it does is to expose a REST API under slash, uh, which accepts get requests. And it, it, it's not doing much, it's just returning a low word, so it's not very complex. Now, in order to do structured logging in Python in the good way, to use the existing logging mechanism, so the logging mechanism uh, lives in here, and this is the import for Flask, so we created a structured log. So we, it inherits, inherits from the logging formatter, and it takes the record that we want to print out, 
but instead of printing it raw, it formats it into a JSON, a JSONified file. So it would make it much easier to observe and index and parse into later stage. So ultimately what I'm doing is to print out some information and now let's actually see that live. So I'm going to run Python structured logging. It's going to run the Flask application on the following uh, address and port. And then I'm going to call it using a CURL. So we can see that it successfully returned the low world. And within that application, we, uh, we put uh, this logging uh, message into, um, into the logger and we can easily find that it was logged in a structured way, which is good for us. Now we can take it and next time that we're interested to know uh, every log that comes from production or at a certain time frame or at a certain module, we can easily do that. So that's a good example on how to get started with structured logging. And there are lots of libraries and, and you know, things that are ready for you to do that on your environment and your programming language. Now let's talk also about monitoring best practices. I think the first and foremost one in monitoring is to aggregate everything into a unified dashboard. You wanna have everything as much as possible under you know, one solution, one dashboard or one dashboard per application uh, that will be able to ease uh, the, when you're troubleshooting something. Also, you want to define critical metrics and threshold to get alerts on. If you're getting too much alerts, that's what creates the alert fatigue. It means that you're going to ignore alerts over time and that's a bad experience for the business because at some point it will be important and you'll just miss it. So create a threshold that, will, and when you're asking yourself what's a good threshold, a good threshold is when you'll get it at 4 a.m. in the morning, you won't feel shame to wake up and solve this because you know it's a, like the largest business impact that can be out there. Also try to use custom business metrics. I'm going to speak about it more when we'll do tracing, but if you're doing it in a different way, try to ship some more business metrics because that's what matter the most, not the application, but what it delivers, which is the business. And ultimately in monitoring, what we wanna do is to collect application level metrics. I find myself a lot uh, through uh, you know, uh, customers and other engineers that saying, we've got all monitoring in place. We've got CPU and memory and disk and network, but what about your application? Everything can seem to be working right or nice, but your customers are experiencing issues or something doesn't work properly or your customer experience uh, is bad because they're getting slow requests. So all of these examples are part of very important monitoring that should be in place. And again, we're talking about best practices. So let's uh, go and understand what it actually means. So for that, I created an APM middleware. So what I wanna do now is instead of uh, handling every time to log manually to say what endpoint am I uh, taking care of and how long it takes and what's the status code, I want to have something more automated. And automated in this kind of frameworks usually means a middleware. So we're creating a Flask middleware that is actually going to use the same uh, structured logging that we've used before. But this time the middleware is going to handle the incoming and outgoing requests that our Flask web framework is handling. So before the request starts, we're capturing what's the start time. And once it's done, we're capturing what's the duration, what's the path that we're handling, status code, the content length, and the application name. So again, we're combining the structured log and on top of it, a middleware that will allow us to do application performance monitoring. Now let's see that actually live. So let's do Python APM middleware. So it's going to run again our Flask application. And over here, let's call again to our service. It returns a lower word, which is good. And now we can see that on top of the rest of the things that we already see, we have things like duration, status code, content length. All of these things are crucial when we, when we want to understand what's the uh, percentile, the 90th percentile of this specific endpoint across production environment. So that's a really good metric to know that our customers are having the best experience that they can have out there. So that was another example for APM middleware. I think that even reviewing you know, all of the best practices, something is still missing with our uh, ability to observe the system because how do we correlate between metrics and logs? We have a metric of you know, slow request and we, now how do we find the log that is relevant to this slow request? Also, I've showcased a really small example of just a Flask application, but what happens when this uh, becomes complex, when we're having several services and we're having more complex applications? So how do we correlate that from end to end? 
all these things really lead me to distributed the tracing and that's the way to actually observe modern applications. So let's start first with understand what distributed tracing is. As you can see on the right hand side, it's pretty simple. Distributed trace tells us a story of how a request is moving from one service to another in our system. In this example, we can see an incoming request from the client that goes through the load balancer to the authentication service and the billing service and some other proprietary service that we're having. So that's all distributed tracing does, composing this uh, story for me. Now, in order to do distributed tracing, we have two things that we need to do. First one is to generate the traces, obviously because nobody is going to generate these traces for us. And secondly, to ingest them and have a client that will visualize them for us. Similarly to log, we can push the logs somewhere, but this somewhere needs to be something meaningful that we can actually use, like again, Elastic or any other log aggregation. For generating traces, we got open tracing and open telemetry as open standards uh, as part of the CNCF. And for the client that will visualize this kind of traces, we got Jaeger and Zipkin. And Jaeger, again, is another part of the CNCF uh, community. So let's start with how do we generate the traces, which is the first step to, uh, to actually get started. The first thing that we need to do is actually to instrument every call. Instrumenting, instrumenting is pretty similar to the middleware that we just saw. So in other words, we need to hook ourselves into everything meaningful that happens in our background. So it can be AWS SDK calls, HTTP calls, Postgres, Spring, Flask, Express, any service or any framework that you're using, and probably there are tons of right now that are, of things that you're thinking, you need to instrument. And it's kind of a manual work, but we'll review what it actually means to do that. Secondly, we need to create a spend for every request and every response. So let's say, let's go with the example of an HTTP request. Now I need to uh, create a spend, which spend, by the way, it's the uh, professional terminology for open tracing and open telemetry. Spend defines three things. It defines an operation that happened in a certain time and took a certain duration. So an operation that has some time frame that it happened on. So we need to create a spend when the request goes out and once the response comes in. So let's say we're calling our favorite third-party API like Twilio to send SMSs to some customers. So I need to hook myself into the start and the end and capture that. Once I already created the spend, I need to enrich it with some more information because just start and stop wouldn't tell me a lot about what happened. I need to know things like what URL am I calling to? What's the host name? What was the status code as we saw before? And you know, many more things that will help me really understand what's actually happening inside this span. Ultimately, we need to inject and extract IDs. Things that will help us understand or correlate between different services. Because now, if I'm having service A and service B that are communicating to one another through HTTP calls, I need to, when the request comes out, I need to have some unique identifier that tells hey, if somebody out there listens to this request, know that you're part of trace one to three. So this is the injection. And then on the other end, when it gets the request, we need to first look if we find this magic header so we know that we're part of a different trace. Otherwise, we will start a new trace. All of this is obviously doesn't come for free or doesn't come for you know already implemented. You have to implement all of this on your own. So just as an example, continuing with Python and web frameworks, in order to capture just the incoming request into our uh, Flask, for example, application, that's the things that we need to do. It's a lot of code, it's a lot of things to maintain. It can become very messy and definitely spend most of your time on you know, building this instead of building your application. So let's have another demonstration of how to do tracing for Flask. So I'm going to stop the existing application and let's jump into the tracing one. So what we're doing right now with tracing is that we're going to use also a library called Open Tracing. I haven't mentioned before, but Open Tracing is open source, obviously, but it's not the kind of open source like a, you know a MongoDB or Redis that you can spin up for yourself and there it's ready. You can run it. Open Tracing just defines a framework of how you should implement tracing in your code. So in order to do that in a standardized way. They've created library that allows you to do that in the standardized way. So let's see what happens. We're going to use the same Flask middleware, but now instead of doing just logging, we're going to use tracing to actually create traces. 
So before the request, we need to create a tracer. And this tracer need to extract IDs. As we mentioned, uh, when we're having an incoming request, I need to look first if I'm part of a different trace, if I'm part of a different chain of events. So first I'm telling my tracer, look for any headers if you're seeing my magic keyword uh, to know. Now we have the spin and we need to start it because we're saying, okay, we're starting a specific operation, for example, get or post operation. And we want to add some information to that. Like for example, what URL is being called, which user is being uh, using this kind of endpoint. This will be very good when we're trying to troubleshoot or understand which user is being impacted and the start time. And also after the request, we want to add some more tags like what's the status code and the duration. And here for the sake of the example, we're going just to print out the span. It's not gonna be very, uh, you know, very exciting. We'll just see that the span was being created, but that's what it takes to create a span just for one operation in your code. Look, my, my old code is probably like three, four, five lines. And just to create a middle where I created more code than my original code. So it's really hard to do and definitely needs to be maintained. So let's do that very quickly. I'm going to run Python tracing example. So again, it's going to run my Flask application on the same endpoint, and I'm going to call it again. And in this time, we're just going to see that we capture the span. Uh, we got a span object ready. And now the second step, as you already know, we need to ship it somewhere, just as we're doing with logs. We need to take this span, format it, like stringify it into a JSON and ship it to somewhere else. So let's go back to the presentation and see what we're doing when we're shipping it. So in terms of the ingestion and client, we need to ship it to somewhere. It means that there should be some place in our system that will accept this and definitely according to our scale, because if we're shipping uh, tens or millions or billions of such traces, it needs to handle this kind of traffic. Also, we want to index and con like the index the context and the tags, for example, the user ID that we just saw, or any other parameters so we'll be able to search uh, based on that. We wanna visualize the traces because I don't wanna see logs. Logs doesn't tell me a story, uh, a picture of you know, what's connecting to another, uh, that's the way to do that. We also wanna set up alerts, for example, when one of our users, uh, a specific user that is most important for us is experiencing a certain kind of an issue, we wanna get notified. And we wanna do many more things. That's literally just the tip of the iceberg with what we can do with traces. So this is the example of Jaeger. Uh, it's not live example, but this is what you'll see when, when you'll ship out traces. You can see exactly from the client side, how long each operation takes and what happens inside of it. This is a very rich uh, trace. So we can see exactly the drivers and the uh, Redis calls and everything that happened in between. We can easily identify where a problem happens and dig into them to actually understand. And we can also see performance bottlenecks. We can see that you know we're having lots of calls to Redis, maybe we should batch them in some way or do something more sophisticated to have a better customer experience for our own customers. So that's what's Jaeger. And I think that's worth mentioning that there are some things that will make us use traces in a more of a best practice or a better way uh, to utilize them. So the first thing called tagging traces, we already had a sneak peek to that over at the example of the tracing, but over here, we're looking to enrich the existing data with some more information. And this information can be identifiers, for example, like the user ID, customer ID, device ID, things that will help us understand more actually what's happening in our service or in our code. Secondly, we can do flow control things. Like for example, now we're handling this kind of events or now we're doing this kind of business logics. So when we'll do aggregation, we'll see how many times each of them is happening and what take the most, whether it's this one or that one. So it helps us understand uh, the, uh, like the overall experience of our application. Uh, and business metrics, which again, we talked about, if I'm monitoring my application, my application is, is my business, I can definitely put some business metrics uh, into the, uh, the actual uh, data over here. So, you know, like, how many items was being in the cart when somebody checked out or how many minutes watched uh, through the video, things that will help me understand and my product teams and my stakeholders to understand exactly what happened. And by the way, again, feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the conversation. I would love to answer them. I'll soon refer to the question around uh, the structured logging. 
So another thing that we're doing with tracing is to actually put all the payload. As we saw, it's pretty simple to just add more information to the tracing. So why only do it in a limited way? Let's put everything, for example, like HTTP headers and body, for example, from that we'll be able to already capture the IDs out of the box. Or for example, when we're calling a database, whether it's SQL or NoSQL, let's put in the query, the, the actual query that we're making or the key that we're looking for in the NoSQL database or actually the response payload for an HTTP call. How many times you call the third party API and it's returned like, you know, something that is not 200, like 400 or 500. And now you need to actually understand what happened in the code. So you're adding some more prints or redeploying the code. You're waiting for the problem to happen again. Let's already have it as part of the traces. So that's very crucial uh, when we're doing so. I'm going to refer to some of the questions uh, right now. So. First question was, what is structured logging and why it's important? So as we saw before, and I'm going to jump quickly to the example over here, uh, the first example that we had with the structured logging, think of it that way. If the logs wouldn't been structured, all we could see is just uh, gut user, uh, you know, uh, X on endpoint Y, which is not very meaningful because I can't really understand what happened from it, or I can't filter uh, bring me user X or user Y or, you know, stage production or anything else. Once I'm printing it in that way, I can tell my uh, Grok or any parsing mechanism, take this JSON, take all of the fields and index them. So now I can do things like show me only things from production that the level was warning or above and the time frame was that specific time frame. And within the message, we got user uh, that you know, was a specific uh, user ID. So that's really why it's important. It's, I wouldn't say that it's very simple to accomplish that, but once being done, that really, you can really leverage good troubleshooting for your uh, organization. Now, the second question that I see, are you instrument every one of your microservices? So definitely, yes, let me jump uh, into a, a further slide. You want to instrument all of your uh, services because that gives you the overall uh, view of what happened from one service to another. As we already know, microservices are getting complex and there are lots of messages coming in between the different services. And you know, it can be asynchronous calls, it can be HTTP calls, gRPC, message queues, pop subs, and so on. It's getting complex. So you want to instrument all of your services and all of the calls in order to establish uh, these specific end-to-end uh, -end tricks. And I'm going to back to the previous slide. Uh, I see another question about, could you talk about cost examples for a given product, how much it costs to add tracing? So there are two uh, things to consider when we're doing uh, tracing in terms of the cost. The first one is performance impact, which obviously costs us in terms of experience. And the second one is actually the cost of implementation and storage and what it means to do that. So the first one can be easily solved uh, with, you know, with local agents that collect the information or SaaS solution that you'll just ship it to there uh, and sampling. And there are ways to uh, overcome the performance impact, obviously not zero, but something that is very negligible and compared on the other side, being able to troubleshoot much faster or, you know, solve problems in, a, in an easier way would be much better than you know uh, paying this extra few milliseconds uh, for our uh, for our, uh, tracing. The other side of the cost, and actually, actually, I would refer to that just in a moment, and I'll refer to the other questions in a moment. Let me just finish uh, this point. So tracing can also act as a glue. So once I'm seeing a trace, I want to jump quickly into the logs that are correlated to this trace with this specific uh, request and this specific time. Also, when I'm tracing something, I want to have more information about the environment. For example, am I running on an EC2 instance or a Kubernetes cluster or a serverless function? Tell me more about the information. Tell me about the performance metrics. Correlate everything all together because the tracing already collects tons of information. So let's utilize it to have a single pane of glass that will show an end-to-end -end view of what's actually happening. Now let's talk about the best practices of observability. And now I'm going to refer to the cost. By the way, the screenshot on the right hand side is taken from Epsagon. This is the experience that you're getting from Epsagon in terms of the uh, data that you're seeing and what's actually being captured and you know, the end-to-end -end traceability. And the first point really touches uh, the, the, the question around the cost. 
because the cost, the second part of the cost is how much it takes to implement such a solution, to implement the tracing in our code, to ship it somewhere, to build a solution, to build on top of it integrations and other things. And I think that the best practice with observability is to uh, have this setup as automated as much as possible with zero maintenance, zero training, uh, zero implementation wise and remove all the heavy lifting. So the cost for implementing tracing by do it yourself, and I'm going to refer to it again afterwards, uh, can be very costly. It can be, you know, months worth of engineering time just to be on that state. And then constant maintenance will go from time to time. So the first thing with uh, observability uh, best practices is to automate this setup as much as possible. Now, secondly, uh, we want something that will support all of our modern environments. Kubernetes cloud function as a service, as you can see over here with uh, an AWS example. Also something that will connect all of my services, all of my requests, you know, in every transaction, because as we know, things are getting more and more complex and we want to have everything from end to end. We want something that will help us to search and analyze across all of our data to understand exactly what happened and pinpoint the most sophisticated problems. Like for example, if I'm calling Stripe and a user tells me that, you know, we was charged more than he, he, needed to be. So I want to have the full experience and the full path that my customer uh, experienced from end to end. And you're probably sitting there and you're saying, I want to do observability at my organization as well. That's, that's probably a good time to start thinking about it. Now, you know, first thing that's worth doing is to identify what are the business goals? What, what's itching you the most? Is it very long troubleshooting time? And by the way, are you going to microservices? Are you doing traditional applications? What's your current architecture? So understanding both of this will lead you to a good starting point in understanding what's missing and what kind of a solution you need. Secondly, determine if it's a do-it-yourself kind of project or a managed solution that you're going to pick out. Both are good. Uh, definitely my tendency is to go with a managed solution because you want to do things that are good for your business. And building an observability tool will probably cost you a team worth of engineering for a long time. That's not what your business is doing unless you're like, you know, hundreds or thousands of engineers uh, across your business. Now, I, I think it's worth mentioning the trial several tools to see where the strengths and weaknesses of each and every tool. So you'll be able to compare them and make sure that the new service integrates to your existing ecosystem, whether you're using Elastic or AWS or Azure or in Redis and Mongo and Kafka and Java and Python are, you know, there are so many ways to build applications. So they wanna make sure that we're being covered uh, from end to end. So I'll do a quick summary and then I'll refer to the questions because there are uh, relatively uh, a lot of them and I would love to address them. So just as a quick summary, we understand that these kind of applications require more than just monitoring or just logging. They're just much more complex and we need to have a better understanding to them. And this is where exactly distributed tracing comes to be very crucial uh, in such environments. So we definitely can say today, no, I'm not doing distributed tracing. It will impact your business. It will impact your ability to, uh, uh, monitor and troubleshoot your applications. And I think as a good tip for probably 90 something percent of the cases in the organizations, don't try to implement your own solution because then you'll end up with a so-so solution that you'll need to maintain and it's very costly and you know, not everybody's so happy with that uh, except for the person that did this. Uh, just before I'm jumping into the, uh, the uh, question, so um, you know, we're having at Epsilon free monitoring insights and alerts for AWS accounts for Kubernetes clusters at any scale. And you'll have some extra benefits uh, when you're signing up. So you can go now to epsilon.com slash wiseline, wiseline, sorry, uh, and get started with your own environment. Um, so let me refer to some of the questions that I'm seeing here. Uh, so you already asked how to deal with a PII, PHI security concerns in logging requests. So first of all, if that's a concern, you don't have to ship it necessarily. Uh, in all of the solutions, definitely if you're, if you're implementing one uh, by yourself, but also in most of the solutions, there are ways to scrub the sensitive information in many ways, some automated, some manual, so it won't get out. Also think of it that way. If you're already running on cloud and you're using some logging service as a SaaS uh, solution or you know, something similar, this data is already out. You can't really control it. I mean, you're controlling it, but it's already out. So try to figure out what's best for you to, uh, 
to know that it's going out and control it in a reasonable way with uh, certifications and standards or try to omit it, both are good uh, uh, strategies. Um, and again, yeah, another question about uh, personal identifiable information and health information. So that really depends on the company, but there are solutions uh, to overcome this. Um, I see another question about PII. Again, I know that it's something that this is important for everyone today, definitely in the era of you know, tons of data and information and something can go wrong. Uh, you don't necessarily have to ship the sensitive information. Shipping just the user ID is not sensitive because there is no email, there is no you know, passwords, there is no any identifiable information except for you. You're the only ones that know to correlate the user ID uh, across your system. Usually it's something very random like uh, hexadecimal or a UUID or something that can't really be correlated to a certain user, certain email, uh, and so on. And again, I see another question about how to handle the customer sensitive data. So there are lots of ways to uh, overcome this. Um, I see a question about Epsigon and comparison to AWS X-Ray. Uh, so just in a brief, and I would love to take it afterwards uh, if you want to. Uh, and let me get back actually to the previous slide where we're showing Epsigon. So Epsigon really builds a bigger picture with actual distributed tracing. It supports tracing across Kafka, across AWS services, for Lambda functions, for ECS, for anything that you're using, which is not supported uh, as of today by X-Ray. It also provides a lot of automation on top of these uh, procedures. Uh, all this, only the thing you need to do is to expose some environment variables and that's it tracing in place. Now on top of that, we provide a much smoother and simpler UI to consume with lots of things like, you know, being able to generate alerts, create aggregations, create custom dashboards, and do much more things. So I'd say that X-Ray uh, might be a good entry point if you want to implement your own tracing, but if you want to have a fully featured product that comes out of the box, Epsilon might be more relevant to that. Um, the last question that I'm seeing in here is what about hybrid business transaction? Uh, for example, combination of traditional application stack and microservices and messages. So definitely that's a good question. And I'll refer uh, to uh, over here to identify the business goal and the architecture model. Having a, a traditional application and you know building on top of that new things which are more modern, that's probably the state of most of the organizations today. You know, there are some new applications, there are some old applications, and there is a state to transition between uh, one to another. So when you're picking a solution, first of all, understand if that's something that's important to you. You might say, the monolithic is not very interesting to see what's going inside, I'll skip it, I prefer something that will focus just on the modern stuff. Or you can say the opposite way, I need to have something that will show me uh, something from end to end. So that's definitely uh, reasonable. And the solution that you need to pick, you will have to support it. And I can share from Epsilon, we do have some customers that are using both. So for example, they're having relatively old monolithic Java application, a Spring application running on uh, EC2 or even not on AWS, even on their own data center. And on the other end, they're having containers and serverless functions and other things that are all communicating to one another through message queues, through RPCs, through you know, pub subs and so on, and everything gets connected all together. So it's really a matter of what's important to you, and there are solutions that will address that for you uh, from end to end. I see another uh, question, uh, tips uh, for performance overhead when it comes to tracing and how to sample traces. That's actually a super great question and, and I'll address that. So first of all, um, in many cases, most of the engineers are afraid about performance impact, uh, but I would say that in many cases, it's not for the right reason. They're just afraid of what will happen, but in relatively low scale, uh, like you know, hundreds of requests per second, or even more than that, you wouldn't even impact that, especially if you're running microservices where you know you can easily spin up more or less instances, and you know the, uh, the compute power is not that expensive as you know, compared to the uh, databases that you're having or you know the unique compute units that you're using so in many cases you won't even notice that and you can do many things to benchmark that with and without like you know load testing and performance testing now let's say that you're having a certain scale that starts to impact so first thing with tracing is to aggregate as much uh, the data as possible so for example don't ship out every trace but bulk them together let's say 
send only every thousands of traces. So that way you'll minimize the network uh, impact. Obviously you'll have to have more memory, but that's relatively cheap and you'll minimize the network impact. Another thing that you can do is to deploy a local agent that will collect the traces as a daemon set or a sidecar, something that will get all the traces. So the original application never shifts out information. It's just pushing it to somewhere local that is running next to the original application. So these are two good strategies. Another thing is to sample. So sampling is a bit tricky because uh, let's go back to the example over here again. Now here we're having a Spring application, Java consumer and another serverless function. Let's say we would sample out this uh, service in the middle. It means that the all request wouldn't be connected. We will see just small segments in that. So sampling in microservices can cause you to some blind spots. Now there are ways to achieve it, but let's talk first about the most uh, straightforward sampling. The most straightforward one is uh, percentages. Let's say we're uh, sampling in only 10% of the request. It means that one out of 10 requests will get in. That way for having a scale of, you know, hundreds of thousands of requests, we can make it relatively uh, not impactful. We can also do things like uh, sample some requests, but also uh, sample in conditions like if a user ID uh, encounters in, or if a perf oh, sorry, or if uh, an error is coming in, if there is an exception, we definitely want this trace because it's very valuable for us. So that can be uh, this kind of thing. The ultimate thing is tail-based sampling. So the way it works, each service will send its own traces and along the path, they will say whether they want to sample out or not. Ultimately, the last service that will send the trace, it will get to the backend and then the backend will get all of these traces and the backend obviously of the service or the uh, do-it-yourself solution that you're picking. And it will say, okay, should I sample this in or out? It can be either in the backend of the solution that will do that or within the code itself. So each service will come along and if a service in the middle will have some issue, it will say, okay, I'm ignoring the sampling that should take uh, place. And I'm telling everyone else that we're going to ship in this trace no matter what happens next and it will notify the second service that, hey, even if you need to sample out, put this trace in because that's important. So this is what's called tail-based sampling against head-based head sampling, where the decision is being made at the last resource and not before that. So I see there are no more uh, questions. Again, feel free to start with Epsilon. It's free uh, to get started and you're going to get some extra benefits from that. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining. I'm still here for questions if you have any, so I'll definitely address them. Uh, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much all for joining. Thank you very much, Ron. And thanks everyone for joining us today. And I hope you learned a lot about what I consider to be one of the most challenging aspects of distributed systems and serverless development. Uh, if you could, everyone could spend a few minutes providing feedback by the short survey, uh, I'll post the link to the chat. Uh, we'd great, greatly appreciate that. Uh, once again, thank you everyone. Uh, any questions, I guess we can continue to ask them via the Q&A or perhaps we can ask them uh, open mic. Thank you very much, Brett. It's been a pleasure. Ryan, is there any way um, of like alerting people if they accidentally expose PII? Um, does Epsigon help with that at all? Yeah, so actually you can uh, specify with Epsigon alerts based on the payloads. So you can say, for example, if a certain key appears in your data, for example, let's say, uh, you know, uh, the ID of a person or like email or phone number and things like that, ship an alert. So that's helpful for cases where you're expecting to get some values, but you don't get it. But that's also helpful when you're expecting to not get some value, like, you know, this kind of PII. So that's also solvable, but definitely for all of our customers, we're saying 
you can see what comes in and out. Our tracing libraries are open source. We're not, it's not the kind of, you know, a black box that you don't really know what happens and how it works and what's the performance impact. So you can really take, you know, uh, control of what comes in and out. And then we're telling them, you're seeing the data, you can remove it. You can tell us to remove it, by the way, as being, uh, you know, certified with uh, the top standards, like SOC2, GDPR, uh, EPA, and so on. Uh, we can remove this as well. Awesome, thanks. I see actually another question from uh, Oscar. Uh, so how do you handle implementation uh, like this with the development team? How much time do you assign? So it really depends when you're, if you're doing do-it-yourself or, or managed solution. If you're picking the do-it-yourself path, uh, there is a lot of work and planning to do. It's not like, you know, it's not like a allocating an hour of an engineering team to do that. It's more about planning like a roadmap of, of you know, three or four months uh, to get it in place and training them and telling them what and how to do. Uh, if you're picking the, uh, the uh, managed solution, usually there are instructions that are very much simplified. And in many cases, especially like Epsilon, you don't need the involvement of the engineering teams. And it's definitely good that it comes from the SRE, the architect, the DevOps teams uh, to have better observability to the system because it will benefit both them and the engineers. Uh, so we overcome this with ways to do auto tracing, you know, even without changing uh, one line of code, you're getting this end-to-end -end, uh, observability. So that's something that when considering a tool and you're considering whether do it yourself or, uh, or a managed solution, think of what's the implementation wise and what's the strategy to do so. Uh, so, you know, just in short, I can say that if you're doing it yourself, plan ahead for a long time. And if you're picking a managed solution, that's relatively easy. I can share from Epsilon that, you know, it doesn't consume more than like, you know, an hour of engineering time of the old team uh, per week. So it's super negligible. And usually very early, the engineering team are starting to be involved. You know, when, when an engineer sees this map connected all together, and now we understand his, his own application, he's starting to be the one that actually wants to consume more and, you know, build a bigger picture and add more and more services. So I remember uh, one of the senior engineers kind of giving a, a presentation on Epsigon uh, on the serverless apps repo team. Uh, and, and we were all, all really impressed and then comparing it to X-Ray is, it, it, it's, um, it, it's a difference. Um, I think that for me, the, the big thing that X-Ray has is that like it's more embedded in AWS, you know, it's there and, it, and it's more connected to the other services. Is how, how connected is Epsigon to the other services? Like we've talked about alerting, for example. Um, is it easy to connect it, you know, to Slack and then to SES and, and, and pager duty and all of those things? Yeah, so alerting is super important. And today with X ray, you don't get alerting. For example, if uh, you want to alert us, the previous example that you mentioned with the sensitive information or when a user experienced a bad, you know, experience on your website, uh, you can, well, you probably can if you'll plug in all of the traces from X-Ray to CloudWatch and then define an insight and then we'll generate an alert and you'll build it towards your Slack. Where in Epsilon, it's a matter of a click away and, you know, the Slack integration is already there, PagerDuty, VictorOps, OpsGenie, Teams, uh, and lots of other integrations, including email, including webhooks uh, and APIs that you can consume. So I would say that Epsigon, just, just as AWS gives you good tools for building infrastructure solutions, you can build on top of AWS Epsigon. That's, that's actually what we're doing. But if you want to spend years of your engineering times in building observability solution, that's probably, you're probably doing something that Epsigon is already doing and you're not doing what your business should do. So right, you can build, yeah, you can build it on, on top of X-Ray and CloudWatch and the other solutions and Elastic and Prometheus and Grafana and, you know, build all these kind of things, but that's just probably not the business of uh, most of the, uh, most of the companies. Um, I see another question. What makes difference Epsilon from application insights? So both Azure application insights and Azure monitoring are great solutions. Epsilon gives a more automated way to tracing, uh, which in application insight, it's something that needs to be taken care of manually. Uh, for example, to trace your node application or, uh, you know, 
uh, Python or .NET application. Epsilon also provides correlation to the metrics that are existing on application insights and Azure monitor and integration to logs and alerts and many more things that are coming out of the box, uh, which today in application insights uh, do not exist. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, is, is there an API available or is it all UI based? So definitely there's UI, but definitely there's an API as all engineers out there would like to code something to fetch information, to ship it somewhere, to integrate it. Uh, so we already got an API that people can consume to use it uh, for any purpose. And how would you uh, integrate that with like cloud formation, for example? So actually part of the uh, Epsilon um, Epsilon onboarding wizards uh, is, to, is having to deploy a cloud formation into your account. So we already built the integration for you. From that point on, we're pulling logs, we're pulling metrics, we're using all of the information that already exists in your account uh, to make you not define every alert and every dashboard and every metric and every integration. Uh, so we're using that. And you know, cloud formation is fantastic because it encapsulates everything that we need to do in a, you know, in a package that the customer can deploy in a click, uh, and that's it. That's cool. Uh, and and as far as um, like tweaking things, can you like tweak settings via the cloud formation uh, that Epsigon provides, or is that you have to do specific API calls for that? So it's uh, predefined. Uh, there's no, there's no actually uh, many things to tweak out there because we're just pulling metrics and logs. Uh, you can, you know, shut down things like, for example, don't pull these logs or don't work in this region and so on. But usually people just prefer to get a full observability to whatever comes in their account. Uh, and, you know, to usually people are starting with their development environment or staging or something that they're feeling comfortable and then, you know, after a week or two moving to production because they want the same experience, but in the real traffic. Sure, and, and I imagine Epscon makes that easy or you could just set a flag for something for saying, this is my development environment, this is my staging environment, kind of like send fewer logs in my staging, for example. Exactly, so once you're integrating your AWS account, we're automatically fetching the alias, or you can just set it manually to say, this account is production, this account is dev, this account is this tenant and so on. Uh, it's really important for customers because when, when, when you're having just two AWS accounts that make sense, you usually remember the numbers and that's okay. But in most organizations that we're seeing, you know, an account per team, per stage, or even per application, and you end up with, you know, tens of accounts, it's really hard to manage. It's really hard to remember where's what. Uh, and so that when you're seeing that this uh, trace came from the production, a team A application, uh, you know exactly what it's part of and not, you know, what's the account that starts with one, two, two, three, something. Uh, it's a guessing game. I mean, after a while, you just memorize these numbers, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, could you tell me a little bit more about the free tier? You, you mentioned that Epscon um, does have a free tier. Yeah, so uh, we're really, uh, you know, uh, putting something unique out there. Uh, we're saying that monitoring, the basic monitoring, for example, to see what's going on with your Lambda functions, ECS clusters, Kubernetes clusters, it's very simple. You shouldn't pay for it. Uh, and that's what we're doing. You can integrate all of your AWS accounts, Kubernetes clusters, uh, whether they're a AKS, EKS, GKE, and so on, uh, to get a, you know, a basic, what we're calling a basic understanding to your stack. Uh, so this comes with the free tier and you can set up alerts on that, invite friends, work on that and do everything that you want to do. And then comes the tracing part where you decide which services you want to trace and which not. And that's the only thing that Epsilon what you want to trace uh, will be counted ultimately. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, again, Ron. This has been great. Uh, I've really appreciated it. Uh, and again, if everyone could fill out that survey, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, hope everyone has an excellent day. Thank you very much, Bert, you too, and everyone out there.